Last class, we began a two-part series I'm calling Embodied Spirit. And uh, it's really, the basic teaching is that to realize freedom in this life, the body needs to be the ground. And, and what I mean by that, which is that if you really want to have some understanding or, or realization about what's true, if you want to experience love, the aliveness of love, if you want to love life, serve life, then, and in the deepest way, you want to sense that spirit, that stillness or silence that's really underneath or behind it all, the portal is through this living body. We really can't be here for our life if we're not awake in our bodies. So um, I like to often, through the year, cycle of the year, come back to how do we wake up right here in this very, as the Buddha said, this fathom-long body. And the challenge, as we know, is that as we begin to say, okay, I'm going to come into my body, there's this huge wash of intensity. Sometimes it's very pleasant, but sometimes it's very unpleasant. Um, like the weather, our emotional weather just uh, can unfold in ways that are really difficult to be with. And in the most basic way, when we're really awake in our bodies, there's a sense that in some way we really can't control life. We're living it. But that's scary to us. We, we try to control things. So there's a lot of conditioning. Rather than really inhabiting our bodies, and you might just be trying it as I'm speaking, just to really occupy and inhabit this aliveness, there's a lot of conditioning to leave. And I often liken it to being on a, a bicycle, and the more stressed we are, the faster we pedal away from this present moment and away from this living body. So it's a way of trying to control what feels like too much. We all have our own strategies, but we're trying to control. And what I mostly want to communicate is it's not personal. If we find that we live a lot in the trance of thinking, if we find that when I bring up the the theme of embodied presence that we we get it, that we're kind of living from here up or whatever it is, um, it's, it's a very universal tendency to leave. It really is. And um, yet the degree of how much we pull away, how much we end up in the prison of the mind and really cut off from, from aliveness, that degree is what causes suffering. So we start intuiting that if we want more intimacy in our life, we need to get more intimate with the life that's right here. We start intuiting that. We start intuiting that if we want to heal what I sometimes call the unlived life, and that's a term that Carl Jung used, you know, where the wounds are, you can't do it unless you do it through the body. You have to go to where in the flesh that contraction's living. So we start intuiting that to heal and wake up, we need to come back. But it's not so easy. And, and Western culture exacerbates the tendency. And I, and I say that because in our Western culture there's this, uh, first of all, there's a sense of this incredible busyness uh, that we kind of, our entire economy and our culture is about do more, produce more, be more. You know, it's, you know, the economy is absolutely hitched to ever higher levels of production. There's never enough. Well, what does that do to our psyche? It's never enough. So we're pressing against time, trying to get more done. There's always this sense of not enough time. Have you noticed that in your life? So how often that plays? There's not enough time, you know. I remember a cartoon with you have God in heaven and his angels handing him all these like feedback cards from, from earthlings and each one saying, well, more time, need more time in the day. Oop, not enough time to get this done. Nope. And, it's, and, he says, and then he goes, geesh, I know what I'll do different next time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I heard a story about three construction workers who are standing in a row and they're 
in traffic and they're carrying signs and the first the first one's carrying this really big stop sign and the second one this woman's carrying these uh, flowers and the sign says smell the flowers you know the third one is carrying a sign that says okay resume tearing through your life like a maniac you know <laughs> So we, we begin to sense how in our culture um, there's a sense of speed, how our culture's not about uh, celebrating and knowing we belong to the natural world as much as trying to control it to feed kind of greed and fear, you know. So there's a lot of controlling and with our own bodies we over-medicate and anesthetize and, and so on in ways that disconnect us. And we know it for our children. Um, I mentioned last last class how much our children are because of this virtual world that they're living in, how, how disconnecting it is. The math teacher saw that little Johnny wasn't paying attention in class. She called on him and said, Johnny, what are 2, 4, 28, and 44? Little Johnny quickly responded, NBC, CBS, HBO, and the Cartoon Network. <laughs> So there's this, we can we can feel it with our kids. It's scary. I mean, this is not new. I when my son was, uh, you know, I, I wrote about this a lot because of the the fear that came up in me and how much he was in front of a screen. You know, it disconnects us from the rhythms of life, from birthing and dying. It, it that that becomes unnatural. I remember another story of a father and son walking on the beach and um, there was a dead seagull and the, the child was upset and he said, what happened? And the, and the father said, well, he died and he went to heaven. And the little boy said, did God throw him out? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Why did God throw him back? You know? So there's that disconnection. Now, what I'd like to explore more tonight is what happens when, due to the wounds in our personal history, due to trauma, we really get cut off. Because often we talk about coming into our body and those that are, have a lot of trauma in their bodies find it's not, not only not so easy, it might not even be wise. Okay? So that's where we're going a little bit tonight. And um, share a story, I, I, some of you remember, I hope, because it's uh, one that I find really valuable. I like going back into it, so I hope you do too if you've heard it. And it's a Zen story, and the uh, lead character characters are a young woman, Senjo, and a young boy, actually they're girl and boy when they first meet, Ocho. And they lived right close together and played constantly together, Senjo and Ocho, and they played together very well. And the father enjoyed watching them play, and he, um, you know, he would say, you know, someday you'd make a good match for each other. He said it kind of jokingly. But they, it, they took it to heart and grew to love each other well. And um, Senjo's mother had died when she was very young, so she was an only child. Well, when it, she came time to really get married, her father found her a match from a nearby village because they were, you know, a little wealthier and he felt like it would be the best thing for her. And so he he told her that this is what, he was a nice young man and this is what she was going to do. And she immediately broke down and wept and became depressed. Um, When the word passed around the village, Ocho heard about it and his breath stopped and his heart broke. Well, he couldn't speak, so that night he packed his few things and he kind of snuck down to a small boat and he was going to row downriver and leave the village forever. And he saw a shadowy form in the woods. And he he had a feeling who it was and he called out Sanjo and it was her. And she she said, I couldn't couldn't let you go. I knew you were going to leave and I have to go with you. And so she got into that boat with him and they, they left their town and left all they knew and went down river, went down river a few days of travel and got out of their boat and found some land and, and, and set up their, their home there and ended up having a few children and, and farming. One day Ocho came into the house, found 
Senjo in the kitchen and she was weeping and he, and he asked her what was wrong and she confessed that she missed their, their life. She missed the village and all the extended family and she missed her father. And he confessed that he too was, was missing their old life. And they decided together that they would go back. He said, you know, maybe your father will understand. Maybe he'll take us back in. We can have a family together. So they went back up the river those few days and uh, rode back and, and got to where the dock was that was right by Senjo's home. And Ocho decided he better go first. And he went up to the door and knocked. And father comes to the door and he's looking very stern. And, and Ocho says, uh, Father, I brought your daughter back. Two fine grandchildren. Please forgive us for running away. And the father looked at Ocho. He was astounded and angry. And he said, I don't know what girl you're talking about. Since the night you ran away, my daughter has been sick in bed and unable to sleep, unable to speak. Okay? So Ocho said, no, no, she's in the boat with your two grandchildren. Please come see them. And father said, absolutely not. But he he said to the servant, you go see what's in that boat. So sure enough, he went there and there was... Sanjo with two young children. He came running back and said, yes, it's true. It's true. They're there. And the father shook his head no, and he strode into the bedroom where Sanjo was lying and said, Ocho has come back with another Sanjo (laughs) and and your two children. And her eyes opened in a new way that they had not in five years. And she stood up as if walking in a dream and walked out the door where her father followed her and down the road. And from the dock, walking up towards her, was the other Sanjo. And they walked right to each other, and they embraced and became one. So they embraced, became one, returned to her father's home, and uh, they did make a family together. So Sanjo embraced and became free. This is an old and traditional Zen story, and it has many levels of it, the levels of a broken heart and grave choices, levels of exile. It's a story of splitting. It's a story of when we can't handle what's happening, a part of us leaves. And it's not until there's that coming together that there's a sense of wholeness and freedom. Does that resonate for you? Does that? Yeah, okay. So we each have our ways of leaving presence and and taking what I sometimes call false refuge, which just means it doesn't work. It's not bad. It's just we have ways of leaving that um, end up turning on us. And some of us numb ourselves. You know, we have ways of numbing ourselves through too much sleeping or food or alcohol, drugs. Some of us leave through judgment, through a chronically judging mind, blaming most of us through obsessive thinking. We just leave. And we disconnect from presence and we go into the past or the future. And the Buddha called this being in a dream. And most every spiritual tradition I know in some way describes that we are in some form of a trance or a dream. We're not here. And that really, if you say, well, what is the spiritual path? It's not going into a spirit that's in another world it's coming back into this here-ness and experiencing the, the full awareness and aliveness and love that's our nature when we're present. So how do we come back? How do we embrace the parts that, that uh, have been too difficult at some point to embrace? And it might sound abstract when I say come back and become whole, but we know it. I could just speak with any one of you and you'd say, yeah, I know when I get kind of lost and there's a sense of being cut off and I get tired because I'm not connected with my full energy and I know what it's like when my heart's kind of closed. We know all the flags of trance when we're not resting in just a more open sense of ourselves and our life. We know when we get tight. Even when we're not struggling with a strong emotion, we leave. We're very inclined 
rather than to be here in, in some real presence, to be trying to figure something out. There's, um, and this is very much, you can see this very much in Western science, there's some ongoing restlessness in our system. The sympathetic nervous system in some way is being vigilant, saying, we got to assess things, we got to look for problems, around the corner there might be something I can't handle, got to be prepared. So that's alive and well in these bodies. And so even when there's not some huge trauma we're dealing with, we still leave and we still are, are buzzing along trying to figure stuff out. It's like I, I share that telegram Jewish mom sends to her son, you know, start worrying, details to follow. You know? <laughs> so we know that, that we're kind of getting ready for something. And um, so in the last class on this, a lot of the training that I emphasized to come and really this embodied spirit was to notice when we're lost, this basic training and meditation that is precious. Notice when you're lost, spinning out in thought, and again and again, a thousand times, again and again, just come back to this here-ness. And notice the difference between any thought you're in and the vividness and the aliveness and the mystery of right here. That's the basic training. So there's many ways we can support that. The way I like is to not just come back here, but reopen the senses. So that you can, right now, if you'd like, just to close your eyes. I say open the senses, but it helps to close your eyes because you can really pay attention to your experience a little more. When our eyes are open, we see forms and shapes, but we quickly associate into thoughts and ideas. So as a training, it's helpful to sometimes close your eyes. But if you really want to be awake on planet Earth, then we need to learn to meditate with our eyes open too. But for now, so you close your eyes and you say, okay, wake up senses, let me just listen. And you wake up and listen. Just notice the sounds that are actually right here. And you might even sense smell. Just let the senses of the, the gustatory senses be awake. Taste. And the kinesthetic. To feel the aliveness in the body as we did with the guided meditation, this vibrating space. This is the most basic pathway home. Wake up from the thoughts, come back to this living, vibrating world right here. And then the the guidance is, and if it's difficult, we begin to learn to soften and with kindness and presence, open to that too. So the training is to say yes to this life, And you might explore what that means right now, just to gently say yes to what's going on inside you. Whatever it is, pleasant, unpleasant. And if the word yes in some way distracts you, it's an energetic yes. What does that mean for you? An energetic yes to the life that's right here. If you'd like just to take a nice full breath and open your eyes, that's fine. What we find is that if there's not a strong, unpleasant experience going on inside us, it can be an interesting adventure coming back home again. And if we learn to stay, as we might, let's say, in a longer sitting, and we really learn to stay with this living experience and, and not be off in thoughts, 
we start having some very profound openings in terms of our understanding of what we are and what life is when we learn to stay. But, and here's, here's where we're going to spend a little bit of time, for a good percentage of you, you who are here and those of you listening to the podcast, you'll find that you start coming back into the body and it feels very uncomfortable and the idea of staying here feel, starts to feel intolerable. Like there's a really strong unpleasantness that you might find you want to get away from. And I like to bring that up because when I give a talk on saying yes, there's another side to it. Okay, And I'll read you an email I got. Because what I'm trying to bring up is that the teaching is not so formalistic as come into your body and say yes. It's not always wise to do that. Okay, so here's the, uh, an email. I just listened to last week's podcast, and I think I've done what you suggested there, taken off the armor, pulled off the scales, and the result right now is I'm feeling overwhelmed with the pain of what remains. I'm not finding so much beauty, just longing and pain and overwhelm. Trying to sit through it and wondering if I'm doing something wrong, question mark. Okay, so that's... And then after class last week, similarly, a few people here came up to me and said, you know, when I try to be with what's here, I feel like I'm getting trapped in anxiety and fear. I'm feeling it, but it just keeps going on and it feels like too much. What should I do? So the point is, if it's really intense weather, the guidance that's wise is not to always gut it out, not to always throw ourselves into the middle of a storm. Why? It can get us tired out, discouraged, and in the deepest way it can be re-traumatizing. What that means is that rather than going directly into the body and into what's difficult, sometimes we have to cultivate what I consider more resilience, more space. There's something else first. And the metaphor that I think is most useful, because really we're exploring how do you be with what's difficult when it's too hard to be with, is the one of ocean and waves. That when the waves are really, really rough, And we feel like by being with them, we're going to get rolled, get tumbled, you know, just get washed around too much. We need to spend a little more time remembering oceanness. We need a little more space. Imagine uh, putting dye in a sink, and it could be very, very strong in color and color the water. But if you put that same amount of dye in a lake, the lake is big enough to absorb it, right? So we need to find a way to enlarge our space of our heart and mind. We need a pathway to that and then touch into the waves. Remember a little more oceanness and then begin to open to the waves. We can't get around opening to the waves, but it's not always wise to do it first. Is this making sense? Let me just check around. You can nod or go like this and I'll... Okay. (laughs) All right. So for Senjo, let's go back to the story. At the time that they discovered they were going to be broken apart, um, going with that, opening to that, opening to what they were feeling was too much. So metaphorically speaking, they took off. They did something else. They farmed, they got into the earth, children, relationships. They they had other ways of getting big enough so they could go back and, and be with what was there. They could. She She became resilient enough to go back and embrace the part of her she left behind. Okay. And the meta- and the story doesn't have to be a perfect parallel, but you get the general notion. Sometimes we need to take some time first. For one man went to the Dalai Lama and he had a lot of fear and he was trying to figure out how to be with that fear and how to be a warrior and he asked the Dalai Lama for a meditation on how to be with those waves. And the Dalai Lama's response was Imagine that you're being held in the heart of the Buddha. That's the oceanness, that field of heart space. So sometimes we directly contact the waves, but sometimes we 
bring our attention to what reminds us of something else that's true but forgotten, which is a larger space of heart, of belonging, the earth, the life that's here. For another woman that I worked with, a lot of emotional trauma to do with her mother, and it was bringing up a tremendous amount of physical pain and emotional fear and anguish. For her, her practice was, she, rather than saying, okay, I'm going to go be with what's in my body, first she'd bring up three very close friends. She considered them her spirit allies, you know. She'd imagine them surrounding her. She'd feel her belonging. You know, some, she'd feel a sense of being larger. She belonged to something larger. And then she'd begin to very carefully and tenderly be with the places in her that were afraid. She got to the point where she could look at her mother's picture and imagine the child that her mother was when her mother was vulnerable and young and feel like she was being a spirit ally to that child. So it re- she really opened up. She had to be with the waves, but she first had to feel her belonging, the ocean. So there are many, many pathways we can do this when there's pain, physical pain or emotional pain in our bodies and it feels like too much. If it's strong trauma, definitely the help of another real live living human will enlarge a sense of your field and help to make room. Okay? But if there's no one else around, there are ways that we can enlarge with our awareness, just the way that woman brought her spirit allies in. We can enlarge, and some of the ways I like to do it, sometimes just what I call grounding, where you feel yourself sitting on the earth and you feel gravity and you feel belonging to the earth. You feel the pressure of your feet and your bottom. You sense the earth around you. I sometimes lean against trees and feel a larger belonging. Other people lie on the ground. There's different levels of grounding. There are ways we can breathe that actually relax the sympathetic nervous system and give more activity to the parasympathetic, which means we feel more spacious and at ease. Slowing the breath, deepening the breath. Using that smile down that I often teach actually sends a signal to your body that helps you to feel more resilience in space. And these are just some, some general ideas on how you can do it, but the point is that we need both spaciousness and contact with the waves. And what I'd like to do is guide you in a very simple meditation that kind of gives you a feeling for how you can then bring them together, okay? So if you will, yeah, just any adjustment in how you're sitting so you feel yourself fully here. This will be just a short practice on embodied spirit. So this is going to be, we're going to use the support of the breath as a way of working with the ocean and waves. And the idea is that with the in-breath you're contacting the waves, with the out-breath the ocean. With the in-breath the waves, the out-breath the ocean. And you might just begin by scanning through your body, letting the awareness scan through the body. And feel yourself Just invite yourself to sit down into your body, to feel the awareness that fills the shoulders, the arms, and the hands. To feel that awakeness and space in the heart, chest, and the belly. And notice as you scan if there's any part of your body that is difficult to be with. And you can practice with that a little. And if there's none, that's fine. You can just practice with the generic meditation. But if you have something in your body that feels hard to be with, some constellation of pain that's sore, tight, aching, or perhaps it's emotional pain, fearful, grieving, angry, tight, For many of us, if we feel the 
down the center line of the throat, the chest, the belly, we can find some of that contraction. And if so, just begin to breathe into that area. So you're breathing in and contacting the waves, the exact actual experience in the body. But breathe out and sense that you could let go some into the space around you. So begin that way, just breathing in, contacting whatever waves are predominant in terms of physical sensation. And breathe out and sense the space that you're breathing into as if you could release into that space. It'll help you if you listen to sound a little. It'll help to stabilize a broader kind of awareness. Breathing in and touching the waves. Breathing out and sensing space. Now if you find you're having a hard time feeling the waves, then emphasize the breathing in and just feel from the inside out, the throat, the chest, the belly. And if it helps you to put your hand on your chest or your hand on your throat just to help direct attention, that's fine too. But if you find that the feelings are very strong and that you really need to emphasize the out-breath, the sense of space around you. And visualize space, open sky. Let the sounds draw the attention out. So you're dissolving outward with the out-breath. I'm going to take this a little bit further with you, breathing in and touching, contacting a part of the body that's difficult. But as you breathe out, sense the space that's inside the discomfort and unpleasantness. As if you're sensing an atom and a space between the particles. So you breathe in and touch what feels like living energy tightness, soreness, but you're breathing out and sensing the space inherently inside it, the space it all appears from. Imagine and sense the space inside the experience with the out-breath. So begin to ventilate fully your experience. Breathing in and contacting the exact sensations. Breathing out and sensing the space inside and around them. So you can begin to sense everything's floating in continuous space. Everything is floating in continuous space. Everything is vibrating space. You can begin to sense there is room for whatever is here. That whether you're breathing in or breathing out, you can sense in the background this open presence, the light of awareness, that this continuous space is filled with the light of awareness. You can explore this when you have physical pain, just breathing into the painful areas and then breathing out and sensing the space inside and around it. This is what Annie Lindbergh writes. She says, go with the pain, let it take you. Open your palms and your body to the pain. It comes in waves like a tide and you must be as open as a vessel letting it fill you up and then retreating, leaving you empty and clear. With a deep breath, it has to be as deep as the pain when reaches a kind of inner freedom from pain, as though the pain were not yours but your body's. Do you become the ocean, this vast presence, and the waves come and go on the surface? The waves come and go on the surface. 